I said if there are any house flies, we are inviting them to turn off their cameras and mute their audio. Right, right. Um, you're welcome to uh, keep your cameras on unless there's any kind of background distractions. But yeah, just a reminder to everybody, keep your mics muted um, unless you're ready to ask a question. That'll help cut back on any feedback or echo. And let's see. Okay, there we go. All right, looks like the stream is live. Thanks for getting that going, Tim. You're welcome. And welcome, Rick. How are you today, sir? I am doing well, thank you very much. Wonderful. Looks like you and Tony joined at about the same time. Good morning, Tony. Are you hearing and seeing us? I, I am. I am. Thank you right. so very much. Wonderful. You sound good. Look great. My wife dressed me this morning. Thank you. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. I'm just... All, all right. Um, the stream is going. It looks good. Uh, we're, we are recording, so uh, it is the top of the hour. So anytime you folks are ready to start. Uh, well, we're going to give it just a couple of minutes just to make sure that everyone is uh, here and uh, and that or and that, and then we will get started. Shelly, I sent you a quick note <laughs> in the chat. All right. I see that. <laughs> I don't... I'm fine. I'm fine to conduct. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll offer all assistance as needed. I was going to say I'll I'll help have you help tag team it if I need help. So it's a it's a good group. It is. We've got a very good group today. So uh, I'll turn it to you. All right. I'd like to welcome everyone today to the UN Advisory Council meeting. <sighs> I think there are a few people that are visiting today. And so if we could just do some quick introductions of everyone to get started. Uh, my name is Shelley Belflower. I'm the Academic Technology <laughs> Services Director at Weber State University, and I represent UTTC as well as help vice as vice chair of this committee. <clears throat> Tim, Tim, can we have you introduce yourself next? Uh, yeah, Tim Stack from the Utah Education Network. Or I, I think you were met, met me, Shelley. Thanks. Yes, I did. Thank you. All right, Tim Jennings. <laughs> Jennings Hill with UEN Technical Services. I am the man behind the curtain doing all the yeah, he makes streaming and recording and keeping people muted if there are issues. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. We can't do it without you. That's right. Uh, Laura. Good morning, Laura Hunter, UETN. Thank you, Matt McCullough. Good morning, Matt McCullough, Associate Director with UETN. Nice to have you with us. Uh, Kelly Cole. Yeah, I'm Kelly Cole with UETN. Good to have you here today. And Rick. I think I am unmuted. I'm Rick Gaysford. I am the EdTech Specialist and Co Chair or Chair uh, of the Advisory Council. Good to see so many here with us today. I know, it's great. Uh, Clint. 
I'm Clint Stevens, uh, Southwest Educational Development Center. I, uh, I'm the C forum representative here on the council. Happy to be here. Awesome. You always look so comfortable in your chair. Kevin. Hello, Kevin Reed, Utah State University, Director of Teaching and Learning Technologies. I'm doing one of the short uh, institutional presentations today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see, Tony. <laughs> we can't hear you, Tony. I, I know you, you were waving. We couldn't hear you. Oh, man. I was trying to keep those flies away. Someone sent these flies from Salt Lake down to Cedar City. I can't believe it. You guys enjoy. It's great to be with you today. Teacher Thank education. Dina. I'm, I'm Diane Simmons. I'm the uh, BYU Broadcasting. I'm the public television representative. Thank you. Diana, that's an interesting way to say your name. I, I want to make sure I get it right. No worries. Denise. Denise Elwood. Denise Elwood, admin UETN. Good to have you with us today. Brad? Uh, Brad Welch with Centricom, just representing Rural Telephone. Awesome. Michael Shippey. Good morning, everybody. Michael Shooping, um, Associate Director of Administration for UETN. Awesome. Barry. Sorry, uh, I'm Barry Bryson. I'm uh, Associate Director of Technical Services, UETN. UE10. Awesome. Thank you. James, did we get you? We got you right. Everyone's jumping around, so I'm I'm always not sure who I've asked. Okay, let's let's jump to Hal. Hi all, Hal Raymond, uh, Weber Innovation Early College High School in Weber School District, presenting digital learning. Awesome, thanks, Hal. Jason Hill. Hi, I'm Jason Hill with Utah Valley University. I'm doing one of the presentations as well. Great. Jeff. Hello, I'm Jeff Agley with uh, UETN Technical Services. Awesome, thank you. Jim? Hi, I'm Jen Mauger I'm with UEN um, Software Contract. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Hartley with the Utah System of Higher Education. Great, Jim Stewart. Hello, this is Jim Stewart. I'm the CTO here at UETN. Great, good to see you again. Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Garrett from the Utah Education Network. Kimberly, did, are you, you already, did you already introduce yourself, Kim? I, I did earlier, but I'm with the okay. Department of Workforce Services. Okay, Maria, or Marie. I'm Marie Erickson with the State Library. All right. Did I miss anybody? You missed uh, me. I... This is Leslie Baker, the Library Director at UVU, and I'm representing the Utah Academic Library Consortium. Awesome. Uh, RC. Hi, I'm RC Callahan with Weber State University. I'm here representing distance ed and canvas admins. Awesome. Susan? Hi, Susan Cohen, public relations specialist with UETN. Uh, thank you. Rich? Rich Finlinson, UETN Communications. All right, and Tiffany? Hi, I'm Tiffany Hall. I'm with Salt Lake City School District and I'm representing professional development, I believe. Good to see you. All right, I think that's everyone now. Did I miss anyone else? Yeah, I'll say Tom, uh, Tom Cheatham, University of Utah, representing research. I'm a professor and I direct research computing on campus. Awesome, thanks, Tom. I, I think I saw it said Thomas and I was thinking I hit Tom earlier, so I'm sorry I missed, skipped over you. Anyone else? Tim Benson, CTE Teachers, I'm in Cedar City. 
All right, great. All right, well, if anyone else jumps on and we need to introduce you, please speak up. We'll move on to the minutes. I don't know how many of you were able to go through the minutes, uh, but we'd like to make sure that they have, uh, if you've had a chance to look at them, do you have it? Does anyone have any updates? Okay, hearing none. I'd like to uh, ask for a motion to approve. Clint Stevens, I so move. And a second. Hartley, all second. Great. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I guess it'd be easier to say, does anyone not approve, right? Okay, hearing none, minutes are, are approved. <clears throat> Next up, we have the content policy draft. The link is in our agenda. And I believe that is going to be who will be discussing this today. Should we just go through it? Sorry, Shelley. It's me. It's Laura. Okay, great, Laura. So this is the second, hopefully you're, you're able to see that on the screen. This is the second and final reading for this new policy that the board will be taking action on at the end of the month. So this is a policy that describes how we go about selecting our content. I'm just gonna scroll through it real quickly so you can see it. Since this is the second reading, I assume that you've already um, taken a look. So the criteria that we use when selecting content, and most of those come from a document called the Public Media Integrity Guidelines. Um, so they're the foundational reason why public broadcasting exists and some of the, the things that we stand for and the things that guide our decision-making with uh, content. Um, there's some discussion, and, and those of you that work in library world um, will, will recognize this language about the importance of content maintenance, making sure that information is accurate and updated regularly and fresh. And then if members of the public have any concerns about our content, there's a reconsideration procedure. So this describes the process of having them cont contact us if they have a concern. There will be an online form to fill out um, so that they can express their concern and then provide some details so we're able to do some research on it. Um, we do have in this policy that if content is being questioned, we will generally keep that available during the review process. And we have a 30 day review process where we'll take a look uh, more deeply into that information. And then we'll keep the, the complainant informed about the process the whole way through. Um, there is some information there about um, how this particular policy is maintained. And um, then at the end of it, you'll see these are the forms that a user would um, be submitting if they have a complaint about our content. Um, and this, this would apply, this policy applies to content that's on broadcast and also things that are digital content that's on our website or things that are in e-media or products that we license. So it's really the, the full spectrum of all of our content that this would apply to. And I'm open to questions if you have any. Like I said, this is the second time that this committee has reviewed the information and the board reviewed it two months ago and then we'll be taking action at the end of this month. Hey, Laura, this is Clint. Uh, have there been any updates to it since we looked at it last? Yeah, good question. There were a couple things, but they were mostly grammar, language kind of things. The, the substance and the content is the same. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, uh, and maybe I know that, and I and I see that you know this is really an important need to to have such a policy like this to be able to fall back on. Because I think in this last month there was a challenge to some of the things again. Seems like a old old skeletons came out again. Uh, and that I don't know if you want to 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 address that here, or um, is it related to? Uh, I remember reading the news story on uh, related to EBSCO again. Um, but I think this policy is 
the way that you would you would deal with those kinds of things. I think it does spell out why we need to have such a policy. Yeah, thanks, Rick. And there are some other um, procedures that we follow. So if it's something that's on broadcast, a member of the public has the right to appeal directly to us or to the FCC. So for instance, if they're concerned about any of the content, if there was a, a swear word or something that was inappropriate, there, there are clear processes for that. So this is our um, effort to make sure that those are clear for what happens with what's on our website and what we deliver locally. Um, so it, it's just consistent with those policies. And I will add, there's a couple, I mean, we, we're here to serve the public and we take input from the public. That's why you exist as a community advisory board to give us advice and input into um, the direction of our work and make sure, making sure that it meets the needs of the community that you represent. So that's very intentional. And um, we wanna make sure that we're really respectful through this process. So we acknowledge a complaint right away. We do ask that it's in writing, which is a new, um, a new process just to make sure we get all of the information. We keep the contact information for our, our leadership team open to the public on our website, which is a, a FCC requirement. So hopefully, you know, our goal is to keep it very transparent so there aren't questions about what, what leads to these kind of uh, content decisions. Yeah, I, I, it, to me, this is just a really valuable policy right now because there was another e email exchange that occurred uh, so when a parent had asked a question and Laura was able to respond rather quickly to to that, but I think she could have easily fallen back on the policy to make sure that the form is filled out so that we get all the relevant information and it's, you know, and, and that. And so I think it's, 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 it's a really good policy if uh, it will be helpful. Laura, where does it go after this committee for a final approval? Is this the end? No, so the this has to be enacted by the full the governing board. So at their meeting in a couple of weeks, they'll review and do their final action on this. So they had a first reading two months ago, um, and then it would be adopted as a policy of the board along with our other policies. And we do have a policy maintenance section that says it will be reviewed at a minimum every five years, but if there's something that requires additional review, we would do that at any time uh, with the board. It, it would be a policy of our board. Correct. So the only question to to this group is: Is there are, are there any, is there anything in there that you see that you don't understand or may need clarification or uh, and that you know just to you know even a grammar item. <laughs> it's kind of nice to be in that stage <laughs> with everything. I do want to say, because we have our library partners um, in the advisory council, Marie and Leslie, our, our public library and academic library partners were really helpful in crafting this. There's a, uh, this is very standard for public libraries to have a, a written policy. And so they were able to share some examples, both locally and nationally, yeah. that we were able to draw from. So that's really helpful. And Diana is very familiar with this also from, from public broadcasting world. Great. All right, do you need anything else from us, Laura, today? Um, just if there's any other input, but it seems, uh, I guess the question is, would you all be comfortable with me taking this to the board with the um, input that it's been reviewed by the council and you all felt comfortable that it moves forward? No. Yeah, I agree. Point. <laughs> and this is not one of those things we vote on. It's just if we, you know, um, we just unless there's any concerns that it would be considered that the, the advisory council is okay all right thank you thank you all right up next we have the CARESAC projects and it looks like kelly will you be talking to us about that today yes, yes. thank you great thank you for giving me a few minutes to just give an update on how everything is going um, I've, I've already been before this group um, before to kind of talk about what we're doing, but I'm just going to give a very brief overview and I'm going to talk about a few of the projects really quickly. And then I believe Tim 
Um, Stack and Jen Mogger are going to talk about a few of their projects. Um, so as you know, we are currently overseeing many CARES Act projects on behalf of the governor's office. They had asked us to put together a, a, an educational technology um, program where we would do subgrants to different groups around the state. Um, we do have um, just a very basic website up right now that, that goes into a little bit more detail than what I'm going to go into, and it's at www.uen.org slash CARES Act. Um, but right now, we have about 115 projects going on throughout the state. And within a few of those projects, there are also sub projects, like there's one project that has 130 sub projects underneath it. So there, there's a lot going on throughout the state. Um, the projects are reaching all of K-12, uh, the State Library, uh, telehealth. They are reaching all of the higher ed institutions. Um, so we have just a wide variety of types of projects. Um, but I'm just going to talk about a few um, since I've done an overview of a lot of those other projects in the past. Um, so Tim is actually going to talk about the teacher remuneration projects. So I'm going to I'm going to um, let I'm going to pass it over to him in a minute for that. One of the one of the big projects um, that I just wanted to highlight is a partnership that we're doing with the State Board of Education right now. Um, we are doing a project where we took about $5 million of CARES funding, and the State Board might also be contributing some money depending on the needs. But we are doing a home internet project for K-12. So the State Board of Education opened up an application window where districts and charter schools could apply um, to purchase services on behalf of kids so that they can um, participate in online learning. So it's a, a project I think is near and dear to everybody. We had about 42 LEAs um, that are actively doing projects. And so the state board is working very closely with them. There's a variety of solutions that were, um, that were applied for. Um, some of them are doing hotspots from a mobile provider. Some of them are actually doing physical connections. Um, there's a charter school that is actually doing Chromebooks that have SIM cards in them to kind of pilot to see how that would work. Um, we, we also worked a little bit with San Juan County School District um, and helped them fund some of the, the, the small portion of the efforts that they're doing down there. And so we have kind of a wide variety. And then the State Board of Education is working to hire an independent evaluator to evaluate the different types of projects that were um, that are being implemented to just kind of gauge the effectiveness so that we have that data in the future. So I'm excited to to find out what they what they determine. Um, so that project is is going on <coughs> very well. Um, we also have a uh, library hotspot lending program. So several of the libraries have asked for hotspots that they can check out to patrons. And so we're excited to see um, how those programs go. The colleges and universities, a lot of them are also doing laptop checkouts and in some, case, some cases hotspot checkouts. Like I know the UVU library is doing a pretty significant laptop checkout program for students where they can check out a computer for the semester um, to be able to do homework and participate in their classes. Um, so those are a few of the of the projects that are going on. I, oh, two other things I wanted to mention um, that the Utah Telehealth um, program they are upgrading their telehealth platform, which is seeing heavy usage right now. That's one of the projects that we're working with them on. And then another really interesting thing is some of the tech colleges. Um, had asked for funding to do things like virtual clinical labs. So we're funding some of those kind of projects that'll be really interesting um, for students that aren't able to go and do clinicals in person. Um, there were a few requests to do some really innovative things under CARES. Um, so we're just working with all of those projects right now. Everybody's kind of right in the thick of everything right now. Um, they all have to be completed by the end of the year. So we're all very busy. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions, um, or we can hold them to the end after the other presentations.
You guys are going very easy on me today. <laughs> Everyone thought you just presented well. That's it. <laughs> there's there's a lot of money involved in all the CARES Act, and and I know we all appreciate those who've been in charge of projects at all the different universities and locations, especially UEN, for making sure that all of that uh, was allocated out. And, and there's a lot of follow-up going on on all of them to get them done. So we appreciate your efforts. Yeah, and the partners that we're working with have been so excellent to work with. I think that's something that has really stood out that, that people are just really chipping in and really working hard and that's very appreciated. Great. <clears throat> All right. Any anyone else? Kelly, did you say a couple of others wanted to present as well? Yeah, I believe Tim was going to present and I believe Jen was going to present. So I just we can turn it over to them. All right. OK, well, I can jump in here. Um, thanks for. Uh, let me take a little bit of time to, to share this project. So um, hopefully by now you've heard of the reimagined teaching uh, project that that UEN has been facilitating. Um, so this is a project just as a quick review where we are recognizing uh, educators and librarians across the state for the extra time they are spending um, outside of their regular uh, workday um, to get themselves additional skills to, to better uh, do their jobs um, remotely. Um, so I've got a little bit of data here for you so you can see how the, um, the project is going. Um, let me just pull this up. Um, so right now, um, we have had uh, almost 16,000 educators sign up to participate in the program. And um, as of today, uh, 2,384 educators have submitted for their uh, recognition. And by recognition, I mean a $200 Amazon gift card code that they'll receive in their email. Um, to recognize them for the extra work that, that they've done. So um, we're expecting quite a few more to sign up. There are some deadlines coming up. So um, we, we have done a pretty big um, communication blitz. So if this is the first time you're hearing about this, we're sorry. We've really tried hard to get the word out. Um, so uh, educators and librarians will need to sign up by October 16th to participate. Um, so that gives us um, a way to sort of uh, estimate how much uh, of the budget we're going to use. Um, and then the, the, the learning, the time spent, they just need to spend four hours outside of their regular, uh, regular day um, doing some additional training. And that needs to be completed by December 1st. And then they need to have their, uh, their, their hours submitted um, by December 15th, so we can finish processing. But they can submit them anytime. It's open. We're ready to take their submissions. Um, we've had quite a bit of traffic at the Reimagine uh, website. You can see the URL down there in the right hand corner. Um, so we've had lots of interest. It looks like, you know, with, with 32,000 visits to the sign up page, half of those people have signed up, which is pretty good. Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight with this program is um, we've uh, collected um, resources for these educators to find training that would be most appropriate to them. And of course, a lot of that, um, those courses and training come from the usual um, suspects that you would, you would think of, UEN, Adobe, Apple, and Structure, and so on. But we've also um, co uh, collected and uh, um, collaborated with some other entities in the state to provide some uh, training and courses that are not usually included in, in this kind of a group. So you can see the, a list of some of the other organizations who have created courses specifically um, for this program and specifically for educators and librarians. Um, and, you know, we hear a lot, well, we hear some from, some from the fine arts community that we don't provide much training for them. But as you can see, um, we have made a good effort and some interesting classes um, coming out of some of these places. Now, if you would like to see some of that, those classes and have a closer look um, at the Reimagined Teaching website, you can go and look under um, all the information here if you haven't, if you haven't been to the site yet, but under workshops and programs, this is where we are um, 
uh, curating a lot of these courses and these trainings that educators and librarians can find here. Of course, this isn't a comprehensive list. If there's other trainings out there or other other things that uh, they want to use, they certainly can. Um, so if you haven't gone here yet, take a look. Um, one of the things I do want to point out as well is that um, uh, we do have an outreach kit. So if you want to help us over the next week, um, get uh, get the word out. You can go to this outreach outreach kit link on our website, and we have all sorts of stuff here that you can use um, in your emails to print to to put in your uh, to put in your subject line in your email. Um, we even have a short uh, a short thirty second animation to describe and uh, the program that you can send out. Um, so. We would love your help in getting more information out. If you if you want to send an email out to your staff or to your um, people in your organization, we even have a pre-made email that you can send out with all the information um, available. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. And are there any questions, comments um, related to this project? Hey, this is Tiffany Hall from Salt Lake, and this has been a great project. We've had a ton of teachers be very excited about it. One of the questions that we've kind of had um, through this is the whole idea of double dipping. We've kind of been telling our teachers, if we've paid you to do the professional development, then you have to come up with a different professional development for this program. I was just wondering how that squared with what other people were doing or what you may have heard about that. Um, that's exactly right, Tiffany. Um, and thank you for giving your teachers good, accurate information. <laughs> But we do get that question quite often, and um, and uh, and most teachers understand understand it. I've even had teachers uh, or educators using um, vacation time to take an hour a day to do the reimagine learning <laughs> um, training during the regular um, you know eight to five. So, yep. And I know most most educators are doing tons of this outside of their work time all anyway. So. Um, we're just trying to recognize them for some of that extra work they're doing. Oh, absolutely. And I'll just say one more time what an excellent class that Reimagine Learning is as well. So thank you for making that a part of this too. Great. And just anecdotally, um, I also, I'm the president-elect of USET and we opened up uh, registration for our ed camp in November, Wednesday with 300 slots and it sold out in about three hours because mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be four hours long it'll count um, for this and we we upped that to 400 and that sold out by 6 p.m yesterday um and we've got 50 people on a waiting list so um and we had a bunch of people you know we mentioned that they could sign up for this and so it's good stuff we appreciate you guys putting it together and um folks are looking for for opportunities to uh to improve and to, to qualify for that for that program. Yeah, and, well, thanks, Clint. Thanks for that. Um, and we have we have plenty of space left. So get the word out. There's a week left. Um, we're trying to let all educators know and, and librarians know. Um, we've had to tell you know we've had to reassure many folks that it's not a raffle. <laughs> they're not getting and they're not submitting the chance for a dollar card. If they do it, they get. <laughs> The, they get the recognition. Um, so, you know, that's unusual. I think teachers think, oh, if I do it, I'll just, I get put in a raffle and I might get um, the recognition, but no, it's, it's across the board. We have the, we have the budget and we want to use it to, to recognize these teachers and educators and librarians. All right. That's great. Thank you so much. I didn't see Jen on today. Jen, are you here? Hi, yes, I'm here. <laughs> it says a number, I guess. That's why I didn't I know. say it then. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so, go ahead. I was just going to say, do you have something to add here? I do. Um, so I was hoping to talk a little bit about the software side of the CARES funding. Um, we are really excited that through the CARES Act funding that we are able to provide several pieces of important software to, um, to our schools. 
um, both K-12 and higher ed. Um, on, I'd like to talk a little bit about each one and, and what we're going to be providing. Um, for K-12, um, we have, through CARES funding, are going to be able to provide Nearpod, um, which is the interactive classroom and lessons um, for five years. Um, and it, it will also include the social and emotional learning add-on. Um, really excited, been in the process, have most schools um, signed up now for that um, charter as well as um, districts um, and getting really great feedback and I'm really, really excited to be able to, to provide that for five years so that the, the educators have, um, have that, they know that they're going to have it for five years. So any lessons they make, they'll be able to carry on and not know, you know, what's going to happen next year. We'll have to redo everything. So th this is a great opportunity for us to be able to provide that consistency for the educators. Um, and then for K-12 as well, we are providing um, Adobe. Um, we um, were able to get the remaining two years of our contract provided for the schools now through the CARES funding. Um, so I know that, you know, that's a big one everyone loves. So that's what we've got on the K-12 side. Um, for higher ed, um, we will be providing five years of Canvas and Canvas Tier 1 support. I um, know that everyone's pretty much on Canvas already, so I know everyone, you know, to be able to, again, provide that continuity um, for five years of that, as well as the Tier 1 support. Some of the schools had it on their own before, and now to be able to buy, provide that additionally for everyone, we're really excited about that. Um, and then we also are until um, through the end of the year, we're going to be covering um, captioning services for higher ed. Um, and then lastly, um, we had an RFP this year um, to look for new proctoring services. And we selected Proctorio um, with a group uh, across of um, uh, members. We had on the RFP, we had members um, from all the higher ed institutions and uh, Far and away, Proctorio was selected as the best um, online proctoring service, and we were very excited to be able to provide um, Proctorio for all the higher ed schools um, for fiscal year 21 as well, especially now with the current state of things, online proctoring is more important than ever right now. So um, we're able to provide that as well. Um, so really, really grateful that, uh, that to the, thanks to the CARES funding that we are able to pass this along to all of the schools. That's great. I know many of the schools are, are grateful, especially for the Canvas thing as the prices were going up. So that was a real uh, blessing for a lot of universities. So, Sir? Can I just add one more project that I forgot to mention at the beginning? Um, one of the big projects that's going to Im uh, impact K-12 is there's a there's a major uh, wireless upgrade project um, that Jim and Barry Bryson are heading up. Um, where we're going to be improving Wi-Fi for for many, many, many schools across the across the state. In fact, most of the districts, many charter schools, and that'll help with social distancing and in increasing the. You know, it's like we have this great fiber network, but being able to leverage that and have really good Wi-Fi um, is going to be really important right now and in the future. And we also extended that opportunity to higher ed, so you'll see a lot of higher ed wireless upgrades. All right. Uh, did someone else have a comment? I think someone else was going to make a comment on Jens. I just had a quick uh, question about the the Canvas um, L1 support. And I know, uh, I don't know if this is on the agenda later, but uh, just wondering what the status of that is, uh, of when we can start using that service. We're super close. It's It's been a long haul and Thank you all for your patience. Um, this is just something that, of course, that needed to go through purchasing and legal and cooperating with Internet 2 because our license is through Internet 2. But I hope to have good news very soon. I appreciate um, it. Thank you. All right. Any questions for Kelly or is it Tim? And uh, Jim, any other questions? All right, any comments about CARES Act projects at your institutions that maybe haven't been mentioned that are significant? All right, then we'll move on to institutional projects. <clears throat> we have Jason, give us 
us a demonstration of how UVU is doing contact tracing, and then we'll have Kevin Reeve demonstrate uh, for the Utah State. Jason. If you're talking, you're muted. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, can you guys see my screen? A huge mountain looks great. Awesome. Okay, cool. So um, <clears throat> I, I showed this a couple weeks ago in our UEN call. And um, essentially what we've done is uh, we've created a, a poster for every classroom with a QR code that is unique to that classroom. So um, all the all the posters in each classroom essentially look like this, except the QR code is is different. And then the URL where it's going to is different. So in this case, the BA stands for Browning Administration and 202 is the classroom. So every one of the QR codes has a, a different QR code and then a different URL. We had we had a list that we imported into <sighs> Adobe InDesign and essentially Adobe InDesign um, automatically created all of these car uh, QR codes uh, instantaneously. So all we had to do is export a PDF, send it to our printer, and then um, the, our, our printing services printed those. And then we sent out a bunch of people to hang them all over campus. So you can kind of see... Um, you know, all the, I think there's over 300, I think there's like 350 unique QR codes. And then what we do with that is when students come to class, they're expected to scan the QR code with their phone and they're given a few options. <clears throat> if the class is, has a capacity of less than 20, they're automatically just checked in. What, what happens is they scan the QR code and then they authenticate by signing in with their UVID and password. And from that, we know which classroom they're in, who they are, their first name, last name, their student ID. Um, we're also even hitting banner with an API call to figure out which class was at, which course was scheduled in that classroom and who the teacher is. And so we're collecting all this in a database and then we're forwarding them to a Qualtrics survey. If they have, um, if the classroom's capacity is uh, between 21 and 40, they are seeing this uh, diagram. And all they do is tap generally where they're seated in the classroom. So this would be zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. So if somebody were to uh, test positive, and they had been on class in uh, the last few days, they had been on campus in a classroom in the last few days, we could notify only the people in zone four that, hey, somebody was in close proximity to you, and you should self-quarantine for the time being. Uh, if, if the classroom is a bigger class, um, for example, 41 to 60, they see a a diagram with more zones and then a large classroom they see a diagram with approximately with 11 zones i believe and this this is allowing us to identify who was seated next to who without um having the instructors take time to call roll and do a seating chart and do contract tracing that way um and so it's pretty simple in fact i can I can show you what it would look like um, from a student's perspective, but obviously they would um, be doing it from their from their phone. And so, let me just bring this down. Oops. I'm just gonna bring that down, and then I can just type in the web address here.
So it takes me to the login service and then it's gathering my information on the back end. And then all I have to do is tap on the screen where I'm sitting and hit submit. And then it tells me where I checked in and the time and the day. And from that, um, we're, we're collecting all of this information on a, on a database, but also it is, I can show you what it looks like um, within Qualtrics. So pull this up, go to our data and analysis tab and slide that over to the left. Now we do have, um, that's, that's gonna take a minute to um, populate, but right now, we have uh, 40, I think we've had 46,000 check-ins up to this point in the first uh, month and a half that we've been open having classes. And so it, it, we've actually been getting a really good response uh, from our instructors, reminding students to scan the QR code. Our uh, provost has been very, um, very helpful in marketing this to faculty and to students in all of our communications to to scan this. And then um, we've been able to go back and look at students who have um, tested positive, find out which class they were in, at what time, who was near them, and then reach out to those who need to be uh, quarantining. Um, what I'd like to do with this uh, and what we hope to do with this going forward is create a, a mechanism to record attendance in Canvas because uh, we have all the information. It would just be a simple API call to uh, send the student's UVID, the time, and the location where they checked in at, and which would essentially save uh, teachers quite a bit of time at the beginning of class uh, from, from calling roll. So that's kind of where we hope to go with this. And um, Jason, Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, do you mind just sharing that screen with the QR code again so I can take a snapshot? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. This one here. And so, and an another nice thing about this is this is obviously, you know, contactless. There's there's no physical contact with any device in the room. It's just students um, use their mobile device or their laptop uh, to enter in the URL or scan the QR code. Great idea. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. And that's um, still pulling up. And then I'll just show you kind of the resulting uh, format of the. Um, so this this is the PDF that we sent to the printing office. And then it was just one um, InDesign. Uh, there's no preview there. It is just one InDesign document that we did a, a document merge with the InDesign document. And we just merged the CSV file that we created with that um, document, and it easily created, uh, you know, the 350 um, classroom codes. So 40, so recorded responses, 47,000 at at this point. So, and you can see mine. It looks like this this one right here would be mine. Yep, welcome to class, Jason. And we're pulling all this information about me, well, about every student, so you can see which uh, major I'm in, um, my college uh, code that I would be assigned to if I were a student, if I'm an international student, who my advisor is, the building, the room, the capacity, and then the, the classroom size. On the back end, we're also capturing who the instructor for the class was and which class it was, which, which course was scheduled to be in that class. That's in a separate database, which we also plan to merge. Um, so that's kind of it. And then you can see which zone I tapped into. These zones are blank because they it was a classroom size of 20 or less. And so if somebody were to test positive in a smaller size classroom, we are basically contacting everybody to have them self quarantine and have the instructor teach remotely. So any questions or comments?
comments. Jason, I think it's a great thing. I'm just wondering how, how are you securing data? So you, it's saved in a new database. Is it linked in the secure site part of Banner or where are you storing it at? Yeah, so our uh, automation integration services team, they have a secure database. Uh, I, I, I believe it's the our ODS. Um, it, it's, it's the standard security that we use for all of our data that we that we uh, kind of harvest and and use for um, analytics. Uh, Qualtrics itself is FedRAMP certified. It's like the highest level of certification you can get. Um, they've got excellent security. Um, that being said, this this survey is only shared with me and our um, emergency response personnel. So like. Um, Robin Ebmeyer and Sue Jackson, our um, our resident um, health Utah health person. I, I can't remember her title, but it you know it's only shared with with people who need to see this kind of data, and then our engineers who have access to it are storing it in a secure database. So. All right, that's great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, well, thanks, Jason. If any of you have other questions, be sure to reach out to Jason. Okay. Kevin. Hey, thank you. Hello, everyone, and I appreciate this uh, opportunity here. Let me get my uh, screen sharing, and we'll we'll go for there. All right. Can you see my screen now? You can. All right. Um, let me just uh, talk a little bit. I was asked to share about our media workflow and uh, things uh, before and after and during the pandemic. Uh, for fall 2020, this is the course types instructors were asked to choose uh, to deliver from. We have the face-to-face -face or the UEN IVC type class, the hybrid face-to-face uh, -face where some students would attend courses in person and others would attend remotely by Zoom, meaning that students may rotate. So the instructor may assign them to come on Monday and the rest of the you know, some students on Monday and the rest participate by Zoom and then it rotates so every student gets an opportunity to attend class. A web broadcast where they basically all attend via Zoom and then online um, so that they were fully online. What's interesting about all of these courses is that media is involved and video is involved. And um, I wanted to show you, we use a tool called Kaltura. It is one of the tools that um, uh, UEN has licensed for uh, the schools in the state of Utah, at least that I know of higher ed and the technical college. This is the plays. I just wanted to show you what happened, okay? Before COVID hit, and that's right here at this spike here, we were around five, a little over 5,000. So let's call it 7,000 plays, right, happening. Look what happened as soon as we stopped, right? in March and started going remote only. We jumped up to peaks of 20,000 plays of video. These uh, dips here are like the Saturday Sundays, right? And you can see it went up quite a bit and then summertime it was pretty low and then finals for summer, we got a peak. Look what's happened fall semester with video at Utah State University. We are uh, that first week of class, right? Almost 27,000 views of videos being played. And then you can see it's still peaking above 20. So from going below 10 before the pandemic to uh, 20, 22, 23,000, basically more than doubling uh, the amount of video. I asked our admin, how much video do we have in our Kaltura system for Utah State? 108 terabytes of video. And like the national debt, that goes up uh, pretty rapid, as you could imagine. All right. Um, this kind of helps put things in perspective of uh, our ed tech ecosystem. These are the tools we use at Utah State University to deliver uh, courses, whether they're, you know, those all those types of courses, even if it's a face to face, these tools, many of these tools are involved. And you'll see many of them that Jen mentioned uh, on her list, the Canvas, which sits in the center as our core tool, that's the learning management system. And then uh, she mentioned the proctoring software, that's Proctorio over here, right? That plays a key role and 
got a significant jump in usage and we needed those additional licenses and licensing from UEN to get us through. And uh, we're appreciative of that. And then Kaltura sits here, very, very, very key. That captioning that Jen mentioned, that's verbit right here, right? We, we need to make our videos accessible to all of our students. And Utah State University does have students that are deaf or hard of hearing. And uh, so we can uh, automate this and send video that's recorded by a faculty member uh, into Kaltura and Canvas and automatically send it out to Verbit to be captioned with no intervention on the faculty's part. And then once those captions are done, they're put right back in. Uh, and then you can see some of the others. Some of these are UEN, uh, UEN contracts that they've negotiated for us. Others are ones that USU has uh, added ourselves. At Utah State, we're always uh, trying new things. We have faculty that are very progressive in wanting to be on the cutting edge. And so we work with them closely to bring tools in and, and try them out. All right, let's talk a little bit about a workflow and then I'll show an actual live demo. So uh, you'll notice here that Kaltura is overlaid on top of Canvas. Well, what that means is um, when we look back at those tools on that last slide, we choose tools based on their ability to integrate tightly with the learning management system. And in our case, in the state of Utah, that's Canvas. And what, what I tell vendors when they come and talk to us, I says, you know what, the best compliment you can receive as a, a vendor that integrates with Canvas is that students and faculty have no idea they're using your tool when they're in Canvas. They just think it's part of it. And, um, and that's what happens here with Kaltura, very tightly integrated in Canvas. Students over here don't have to go anywhere else but Canvas. Faculty can log right into Canvas to access Kaltura, although Kaltura is available as a service outside of Canvas, and there's a URL they can go to. They don't need to. It's one-stop shopping. So faculty can, you know, use something like their phone or their, their uh, tablet, and they can create videos and upload them. They can uh, do desktop or classroom capture. Uh, and what I show here is probably very similar at most of the higher ed institutions using Kaltura. Nothing unique here, but we have, uh, uh, Kaltura has some lecture capture software that we put in all the classrooms on the computers that are in the classrooms. Faculty can also put it on their own computer and they can record the lectures or uh, while they're presenting so students can review them later. It even allows a live stream if they would like to do it. Or they can in their office or classroom record offline and then make it available to their students later. And what's cool about that is we can schedule it. In other words, a, a faculty says, I want to record my class. I teach 9 to 9.50 in this classroom. We can go in and schedule that. They walk in the classroom, uh, open the, launch the computer, start their presentation. It automatically records when it's done, automatically uploads it and makes it available. Uh, we have a studio where faculty can come in and do some professional studio capture and with a variety of settings. So this is one of our faculty members who's actually in that studio and who's created a video. And then finally, uh, we do a lot of Zoom now that the pandemic has hit. And so what we're able to do is record those Zoom meetings, uh, Zoom classes, and those automatically get put up into Kaltura, which also means they're available in Canvas. So students can go back and watch those. Uh, so there's no need to record the class twice, right? There's no need to lecture capture with our lecture capture tools if we're doing Zoom. And this could be WebEx as well. WebEx can record, Zoom can record, but we send that video right up into uh, Kaltura, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do a quick demo uh, for you just to show something. This is a class that I teach and have taught since 2001. And I am the guy who experiments with all these tools. Uh, when we get them and so that I know them. Let's say I want to put a, another video in my class. Here's one that I've embedded. This is a video that I created using a capture tool. It uploaded it and then I was able to embed it right in a lesson page. I could embed it in an announcement, a quiz. Uh, I was able to embed it. Let's say I want to do that. I'll show you how uh, easy it is for a faculty member instructor to do this. I just click the edit button on the page and then I go here to embed media 
And what's going to happen, this is now Kaltura. I was in Canvas. I am in Canvas, Canvas, but this is now Kaltura. And so here's all the videos I've created, including here's a Zoom one I did uh, just a, a few weeks ago on September 24th with I had students in the classroom and some of them remote. And uh, this is how I'm running my face-to-face -face class now. And I've also got some YouTube videos. Kaltura allows me to search YouTube videos and it brings them in. It doesn't physically copy them, but it puts the player around them. And I can even caption these videos if YouTube hasn't done that. So they're uh, okay, for, uh, they're accessible for my students. So let's say I wanna put this video in. Uh, I'll go back here and show you, I, I skipped a quick step here. I'm just gonna go back here and, and close that. But what I need to do is come down where I'm gonna, I wanna put it, click my cursor. We'll come back to the uh, embed media. I'll go down and uh, choose the video I want. Quickly click the embed. Bingo, that video is now there. It's in my course. There's the first one, there's the second one. I'll save it and now it's available to my students. Now this is what a uh, next step. I'm gonna go back into edit. Let's say I, I have to create a video. I don't have one. And so I wanna create one using my laptop's camera. Uh, I'm gonna to go to the embed media again and I can click add new. And this is where I can go find a YouTube video. If I've already created one like on my uh, iPhone or Android phone or my tablet or some other way and I wanna upload it, I can do that here. But I can also capture and this will go ahead and launch a, a software tool that will allow me now to capture. So I'm gonna just record a few seconds. Um, it gives me a countdown, I'm recording. I can choose what part of the screen. When I'm done, I hit a stop recording and um, there it is, it's ready for me. I can name it and I'll just call demo something and I can save and upload. And right now it's uh, going to go ahead and upload that into uh, Kaltura for me, and that'll be right available in, in my class. So let me go there again. It takes a while for it to upload and to compress it. Oh, there it is, it's already started. You can see it's still churning, but I can click the embed and bingo, it's embedded right in a lesson. So a pretty smooth workflow, all integrated in the learning management system from a third-party tool. Most of those uh, tools that I, that I showed you uh, in our in our um, in our ecosystem are are also I should say all of them are tightly integrated and while this isn't every tool that's integrated into our LMS it represents a big part of it. Finally, one last slide. Um, when the pandemic hit, of all those tools, these have been the most critical to keep our institution going. By far, you saw the video one, very critical for faculty to be able to record presentations, labs to show students how to do labs that they can no longer come to school to do. The captioning, the Zoom video or WebEx, very, very critical to keep face-to-face -face classes going. And then the proctoring, and then uh, a new tool we brought on board, Atomic Assessments, another quizzing and assessment tool that just gives us uh, some additional uh, types of questions to help uh, our faculty. Okay, that's all. I'll uh, be happy to take questions if there's any. It's that comfortable silence period. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity. I just maybe not a question, but a comment that our, our K-12 teachers have been doing more video for sure. and and have been struggling with that workflow of how to record it, how to get it into Canvas, where to store the video. And I don't know if that Kaltura, it's probably not available for K-12, but um, it's good to see that, that there's there's solutions out there. Great. All right. Well, so, <clears throat> sorry, this is Laura, just to jump in. Clint, it, uh, we are amending the contract right now, so it's available for K-12. and. Um, so far, one district has expressed some interest, but um, Katie is the product manager for that, and she can provide a lot more information um, about that. And I really want to say thanks to Jason and Kevin. When I saw them 
um, talk about these things and demonstrate them at our UTTC meeting recently. I thought it would be really helpful for you as an advisory board to see um, how the products that, that you have input in helping us to license and provide direction for are being used at, by their institution. So thank you so much to both of you. And I know, uh, especially now where everybody's being more innovative than we ever thought we would be because of the current situation, it's just really inspiring to see what you all have come up, come up with. So thank you for sharing us. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. I, I, do, I wanna comment on Laura, what Laura said as well. I believe, especially in the short time frame that we've had to do stuff, the contract tracing is very important to universities and they're doing it in different ways. And all the integrations with Caltura and our tools, that I, I think it's gonna benefit us a long after COVID is over. So I really appreciate both presentations were excellent. Thank you. All right, any other comments? We'll move on to our reports and information. Uh, first up is our quarterly broadcast report. We have two documents that are available, the programs and issues from July to September, as well as the program highlights. I'm not sure who is presenting this one. That's me, and uh, this will be very quick. First of all, I wanna thank Diana. This was um, Diana's suggestion because She's very familiar with these reports. And so we're required to present an annual uh, quarterly or a quarterly um, programs and issues report to the FCC. And it summarizes the types of programs that you have. And then if there have been any issues like outages or that kind of thing, um, because it's something that we've been producing forever, every quarter, um, it was Diana's idea to just uh, every quarter that we complete it to share it with you in this meeting so that you can get an overview of what's happening and then provide any input that you want to. And then the other report is our October highlights, just like we did at the last meeting, just to, to give you an idea of the kinds of programs that are that are on the channel. And we welcome input. Um, it's not really a big discussion item, but just wanted to make sure that you had access to those documents. Lots of detail here, very, very good. All right, any other comments? I always like when reports have to be compiled like that, that they're shared broadly. I think it's important for us to be able to see what's being put together and, and how it represents the combined effort. So great job. All right, any other comments on that? All right, we'll move on to committee reports. Uh, Clint, I guess I'm up first and then we'll have you follow me. So we had a UTTC board meeting as Laura mentioned, and it was back in uh, September, early September. Well, late September, September 25th. Uh, I would say some of the biggest highlights that I took away from that, uh, number one, we did talk about CARES projects and things that are going on and, and how things are being funded. We also had the information that Jason provided. But one of the things that Brett talked about, and Brett is our CIO at Weber State, and he represents uh, the CIOs for UCI in, uh, on our committee. And he talked about the new UCI CIO operational plan. That was one of the things they brought up. And I know for Weber State, we, we've kind of had this transition period with a new president who's been here now about a year and a half, and we have yet to complete a new strategic plan under this. And I think it really has to do with, uh, you know, some transition periods as well as COVID and, you know, people not being able to get together for that to happen. So there was a great appreciation for a kind of a statewide operational plan and I know as Weber, we have kind of grasped this idea of an operational plan for IT for Weber State and what we're doing. And so I really uh, enjoyed the conversation. It's nice to hear how other universities across the state are looking about uh, at technologies and how they're planning for it in the future and what major projects or initiatives that they're working on and, and being able to get some real measuring data. We did have a uh, 
a little bit of a report from Christopher Phillips on accessibility, and he's doing some great work there. We we haven't been able to meet for a while, but he talked about some training and, and how he's working with some schools. And then we had some discussion items around things we've already talked about today. Like I said, CARES, but also Proctorio, some privacy concerns and, and how that would roll out, as well as uh, the group is very adamant about asking questions. And I think what each institution provides as part of UTTC is a look from their institution and, and an opportunity to network with others across the state in similar situations and get answers. You know, these are the issues we're having and how is this working better at your university? So I really appreciate the group and, and we are there on behalf of a lot of the uh, colleges, all the colleges across the state, including the technical colleges, which are now all combined. And I always forget their new acronym. I still called it UCHI, but it's the UCAP or something like anyway, whatever it's, it is. It's still UCHI. Okay. Yeah, it's still UCHI. You're safe. Okay, still UCHI, but includes more than just our higher ed, also all the higher ed technical colleges, which we uh, really appreciate the efforts of all of those universities. All right. Uh, we were supposed to have an upcoming in person meeting on our next UTTC meeting as well, because we have a couple virtual and then an in person. But of course, our next in person will be virtual and, and we'll meet again in November. So I'll make sure to give you an update at that time. All right, Clint, you have the floor on Utah uh, Content Forum. Thank you. And that's what C Forum stands for. And everyone kind of forgets what C Forum stands for. We just know that. Well, you know, everyone who's in the group, I guess, knows that C Forum is just all of the, you know, getting together and, and sharing uh, all of the the technology trainers and coaches and and even more and more now the digital teaching and learning specialists. Um, so let me share my screen. I've got just just a couple of websites to share with you. Not a big deal. Um, seeing my screen, good. Okay, so. Um, there is a mailing list. A lot of information goes out. As, you know, everything that uh, the, the CARES funding that UN has been doing, is, it goes out to the C Forum and the you know the reimagined teaching and all that kind of stuff, so that we can help disseminate it out um, to uh, to everybody that that needs to get it. Uh, traditionally, this group uh, since you know back late 1999, so you know last 20 years or so, um, has normally gotten together once a month about six times a year um normally each uh each district a district takes turns hosting the event uh and then the district kind of decides what the the topic and the theme is going to be you know normally it's sometimes it's training a lot of times it's the district sharing their best practices and what's going on uh with COVID, as everything else we've had to kind of pivot uh to, to to meeting online and um since um, for so for this year, you know, the first time we got back together, we kind of just did a big debrief and shared, you know, what's what's working, what's not, what teachers are struggling with, what successes uh, we've had, a, you know, with that switch to, to online and hybrid and blended and and all that kind of learning. Um, but then going forward this year, uh, we'll be instead of, you know, meeting in a different district and having them decide the agenda. Uh, we're going to focus and do a deep dive training uh, on some different, you know, software platforms that that everyone in the state has access to. So last month uh, was was a deep dive into the all the different things that uh, Nearpod can do. Uh, then their new video tool, which is great, you can embed uh, open ended and multiple choice questions within a video within the Nearpod presentation now, and you know, in addition to all the other great things that it can do. Uh, integrate with Canvas and Flipgrid and, and those kind of things. Uh, so then uh, there is a, a C Forum Canvas course. And so that's where all of the, the meeting notes and and uh, all the resources and everything. So the next, well, I lied. Utah's online library was the focus of the last one. Uh, the UEN one on September 11th, that was the Nearpod focused one. And so coming up next month is going to be focus on Google. December will be Adobe. And you can see uh, you know, the rest of the, there was only one district that said, yeah, well, we'll we're willing to, to host everyone, but uh, we'll, we'll do that out in April. So we'll see what life is like then. And that, that may even be a virtual one 
uh, as well. The March 5th one, the March one is always uh, the USAC conference. The USAC conference will be virtual this year. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in conjunction with the reimagined teaching uh, program that the ed camp we normally do uh, as you said, this is different hat now. Uh, you said we normally do uh, three or four different ed camps around the state. Uh, and those are where teachers just come through. There's no set agenda. There's no presentations or anything. Uh, they just get together and people say, I'm willing to talk. I'd like to talk about this. or I'd like to learn more about this or I need to, I'd like to have a discussion about this. And so just people coming together and facilitating that discussion. And so that normally took place in different places around the uh, the state. We're doing one virtual this year. And as I said, we kind of sold out. And so as we've been meeting, I'm kind of following an email thread uh, to see if we're going to try to do another one or if we're just going to cap it off. So there may be more information and maybe more opportunities that way coming. Uh, but then we've also uh, confirm that you set this year will be will be virtual. And that'll be uh, not March fifth. The USAC conference is March fourteenth, uh, fifteenth, around in there, middle of the month. Um, but that's how that's what we do, and it's just a great group. I had a conversation with Justin Brooksby. He's uh, the the lead at UEN Professional Development, and also the one who kind of brings everyone together and uh, kind of does the organizing of, of C Forum. And just anecdotally, kind of over the years, when I first started, uh, you know, 14 years ago, this group was, you know, when when we'd get together, there'd be, you know, 20 to 30, you know, people max, probably. And as the digital teaching and learning grant has come in and and as ed tech has become more and more important, um, when I started in, in Southwest Utah, I was the only technology trainer back in the day. And then our bigger districts like Washington and Iron, they hired like one person. But you know, now our almost all of our rural, even our rural districts are starting to add coaches and and digital teaching and learning specialists. And so the point of that is just this group just keeps growing and growing and growing. Uh, and the stuff that is shared is is great. Uh, gets so much benefit. And I just I, I just always love Utah's attitude of of education and technology and education, it's, it's a team sport and we all, you know, practice together and play together and try to help each other out and uh, just do a great job of sharing and, and helping each other out. So that's the focus of C Forum. That's where it's been. That's where, that's where we're headed. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Any questions, comments for what that group does or? Thanks, Clint. I might I might add that Laura Hunter was the genesis of getting C form started. Not often you see something go on for 21 years, and it's and it's as valuable today as it was 21 years ago. Yeah, and it's not losing steam. If anything, it's it's a snowball. It's <laughs> it's getting bigger. And bigger. Yeah, uh, probably what we have 50, 40, 50, 60 every time. Uh, uh, Justin and I were talking, yeah, we're about in the in-person ones, you know, before we, when we still could meet in person, it was about 50, 60, uh, there, we do partner with, uh, some, some software companies in Utah and those, you know, there was one loose, uh, in structure, you know, and those got to be 70, 80, 90 people, um, yeah. around the state. So, and Justin was driving when I talked to him, so he couldn't look at the, the mailing list to see how many people are. Are getting the the notifications uh, when those go out. So. And to your point that uh, this, I've mentioned this to my colleagues in other states, and you know, we have communication with this group, and it really keeps everyone moving forward. Uh, but we also have, you know, with the TCC group that we have, which is more the tech directors and more the IT side, that communication and being able to. Uh, uh, and how we collaborate and work together was really evident during the uh, pandemic when we first started the closure. Um, when we, when this group met in April, they shared all the th all the resources that they had compiled and put together and were doing for their teachers that kept education going in this state. Um, and I have to say that that did not happen in every other state because I have uh, experience with my granddaughter living in. Uh, in another state where uh, basically school ceased on, on on March 16th and they never got going again. Wow. 
But we pivoted in four days, mostly because of the collaborative work that these group, these people were able to do. So thank you, Laura. <laughs> All right, hey, Clint, I did have a question. Is this focused on on K-12 or is it K-12 and higher ed? Uh, we do have some higher ed participation from time to time, but mostly mostly it's K-12. Okay, I, I saw the list in the links below that group that all looked like they were K-12 school districts. So I, I figured, yeah. but it didn't really specify that on the web page. So I was curious. Particularly, some of the colleges of education have participated. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. Appreciate it. All right. We have some recent video productions. It looks like or have been out there. Some good news. Uh, some good education news. Back to school. The UEN homeroom and an art connection. Does anybody want to talk about these? specifically um this is laura i'm going to turn the time over to katie in just a second since her team produced these but uh, right. from we're just making an effort when we have these advisory council meetings to link to the the productions that have happened recently so these are three that katie's team um i think did a fantastic job on that she can highlight for you awesome thanks katie thanks well um i'll just let you play them on your own time but Here's a couple of the productions that we've been working on. Um, if you've seen our Some Good Education News, this is modeled off of John Krasinski's, um, well, he hasn't done them anymore, but um, focusing on education's good news. Um, so there's that one. And then our also our UEN Homeroom podcast, um, that's still going strong. And then our art connection, don't be alarmed when you see um, some of the images from this one. This was filmed before the pandemic, but this is um, highlighting um, how art was used to um, teach Utah students about Utah women's history. So that features an event at the Capitol. So pre-COVID times, but um, a lot of fun productions that are still coming your way um, from our media team. So I hey, opened Katie, all three to make sure that I get to watch them. So, Katie, did you want to mention if there's a um, any famous politicians that make a cameo in that? <laughs> That's right. In our Some Good Education news, we have um, the governor that had pre-recorded our, our weather segment for us. And it was a little bit ironic when we had those huge windstorms that we were able to report that the weather was still great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much uh, for all the good work you guys are doing. And Katie, uh, it's a pleasure to work with you. Oh, likewise. Thanks, Shelley. All right. Do we have any topics of conversation as we move on to the round table? Uh, it gives you an opportunity to speak, uh, comment, give updates maybe of items from your university or recommendations to the council. Just again, an opportunity to thank all the work UEN and you at USBE have been have been doing as far as the CARES funding and what a what a huge task and what great benefits are coming from that. So just thanks everybody for that. That's great. This is what we do. I, I don't, you know, of, of, of note, I, I'll just ch chime in. Of note, uh, maybe I'll, um, I was. And been in some meetings with some of my colleagues and that, and of course that you know everybody was hoping that they could get a little bit of the uh, trying to figure out how they could get some of the CARES Act funding for for education technology and and, and that. And uh, I haven't even really dared say how well we've done in Utah. Not only when, when you look at the funding that UEN has received. 125 million dollars that is supporting both k-12 and higher education um from technical you know from the technical you know back end uh, all the way to uh, you know helping instructors uh gain to it's i don't think there'll be another state that will do what we will have accomplished um in you know with these 
in successfully getting these funds, but then implementing them. And that's just not all of it, you know. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of other resources that have been, you know, that have, you know, gone out to help uh, schools and that uh, with other CARES Act funds besides those that UEN uh, receives specifically. And those funds that UEN received were because of the great work that they have been doing and the, and the reputation they have of getting the job done. And they knew that they could give them that money and that would be able to be done well and be done by December 31st. And uh, so we are in a unique position in this state. And I think you know, it's nice to be able to report those things, but it's also the good work of this group and the people that you work with. And I just don't think we can thank them enough for all that they have done to put us in this kind of position. I tell my group at Weaver, uh, these are the stressful times, right? Because we have these looming deadlines of the end of the year to get them implemented, but they're doing it with, you know, with great strides. And I, I certainly appreciate the work that all universities are doing on that behalf. Diana, did you have a comment? You're, you're muted. impressed I am with uh, everything that uh, UETN has done and then all of your partner organizations. Thank you. Great. All right. Any other comments? You guys are a quiet group today. We're zoomed out. <laughs> I, I'm sure I could give you a little bit of a, what, a 35 minute break. Uh, between I had, I had seven and a half hours of Zoom on Wednesday. <laughs> My eyes were just like. <laughs> Mine was that way yesterday and about six every other day this week. So I, I get it. It's tough. I, I'm, I'm always grateful for a 10 minute potty break or something. <laughs> All right. Well, appreciate everyone participating. Today. There's no other comments. It looks like our next meeting is scheduled for December 3rd. And. That is a Friday, right? Well, I'm pretty sure that's a Friday. I'm gonna look real quick. Gosh. It's a Thursday, actually. So Thursday, uh, December 3rd, will be our next meeting. And if any of you think of projects that you'd like to produce, reach out to Lauren. She can get them on the calendar for that day. All right, I'll take a motion to dismiss. Do we do so, Robert's rules? I'm, I'm uh, so, so moved. <laughs> Everybody, you get, you get 34 <laughs> extra minutes. Time back. Okay, <laughs> thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you, Shelley. You're welcome, Rick. Great job today. Thank you again, Laura. She already jumped off. She missed the monster. We'll see you all.